Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Thumbs up, thumbs down, hopefully all thumbs up. Well, we are so happy that you're here, whether you are in our in-person or online community. And um, it is a little chilly, but still a beautiful day to worship the Lord. So if you're able, please stand and join us in worship this morning. times I failed, still your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, still I am caught in your grace. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fails. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all faith. The art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond. 
beyond all fame. My heart and my soul, Lord, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the shine when all else fails never ending your glory goes beyond all fame in my heart and my soul lord i give you control consume me from the inside out lord let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fails. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. And the cry of my heart is to spring you praise from the inside out, Lord, my soul.
Ephesians 1.18, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Philemon 1.6 says, And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Romans 10.15, And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your a new day dawning it's time to sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before you let me be singing when the evening comes bless the Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. Your rich in love and your slow to anger, your name.
microphones and I just don't get along. <laughs> anyway, David in his short time with us, that God allowed us to be with him and him with us, he made such an amazing impact on hundreds, if not thousands of people. And it, it's overwhelming when you think about it. A young man of his age and how he loved people. He loved the Lord. He was baptized before he went to see Jesus. It's, it's just more than you can take in sometimes. Um, but I found a verse that made me think of David. It's in Galatians 6, verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. David never became wary of doing good. He is reaping a harvest now in heaven and he didn't give up, he never gave up. He was always loving and kind to everyone around him, even when he was in severe pain. He's such an inspiration and I hope that we will carry on that legacy of kindness, love, perseverance, and as Rob said yesterday, strong, be strong and courageous in the Lord. Um, I'm sorry to go on about this, but yesterday had such an impact on me um, at this service. It was so amazing, and he was so amazing. Um, we have one prayer request this morning. The Wilt family um, lost their home last night to a fire. So please be praying for that family. Um, I don't know how many of you know the Wilt family, but... They lost, okay, they lost everything. Okay, so let's just keep them in prayer for sure. Um, okay, so is there just anybody here that wants to give a little testimony about David and how he was, what he meant to them in their life? Anybody wanna share that? Maybe you weren't able to do that yesterday. You weren't here or you didn't do it. Anybody want to? Okay. So hug one another. I know Pat has a favorite phrase, eye candy. <laughs> he was a wonderful, wonderful young man, and he had a spirit and a soul that will be, never will be forgotten. So let's just continue to live that legacy. Let's go to prayer. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning. <clears throat> we come before you, Lord, on bended knee before your throne to give you praise and adoration, to thank you for being our wonderful God, to thank you for being all knowing even when we're not, for being all loving and compassionate even when we're not. 
Lord, we just are so blessed to know you, to be a part of your family. And I, just being a part of this family of God, Lord, is, is just a part of heaven, Lord, just a little taste of what it's gonna be like to be with everyone that is bowing down to you and praising you, God. We love you, Lord. And we know that you walk with us every single day through everything that we go through. Help us never to forget that, Lord. Help us to be strong and courageous. Father, we lift up in prayer the Wilt family to you, Lord, that they have lost everything. God, we pray for compassion from those who know them. We pray for you to sustain them in their spirit, to provide for their needs, Lord. And God, we just, we lift up our church, we lift up our family, Lord. We know there are so many unspoken prayers, unspoken needs, Lord, that are right here in this room. We ask that you would be the God of all answers to prayer that you would lift up those who are discouraged, that you would support those who need encouragement, that you would love those, Lord, who feel unwanted and unworthy. Father, you have given us a spirit of power and the ability to do whatever it is you ask us to do, Lord. May we be responsive to that spirit. Lord, we pray for our community. We pray that you will protect our service people. We pray that you would lift up our police officers and our firemen, Lord, all the military, God. We thank you for, especially for Elizabeth, Lord, that you be with her and protect her. Thank you for her being with us yesterday. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders. We thank you, Lord, that we now have someone leading this commonwealth that may be closer to our values, Lord. I pray that there will be a revival in this country, that hearts will be turned toward you, Lord, and help us to be a part of making that revival happen. Help us never to give up. Help us to remain strong and courageous. We thank you, God, for meeting with us this morning. We ask that you anoint our pastor, that you give him the words to speak that we need to hear, Lord, and keep our hearts open to receive those words. We love you, Lord. We want to follow you this week. We want to reach out to others. We want to be your servants this week, God. Lord, you are too precious and too loving. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your promises. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Want to hear some more about yesterday? Good. Here we go. It's on. You have a cold. Your ears are clogged up. See, it's on. <laughs> I'm going to pick on Rob, but not real bad. But it's because I love him. Rob has been a tremendous mentor to me in my time here. And there's a good little handful of fellows sitting in these pews right now, and some who have passed on. <clears throat> who have been tremendous mentors to me too. And Rob plays a big role in my walk. So it's all right if I pick on him a little bit. Did you hear what he said yesterday? Most everybody was here. It's, if you missed it the first time, then you probably caught it the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth time that he grabbed a mic. Rob was like the, the MC for the Jesus and Dave show yesterday. 
and I couldn't get over it. I loved it. Because this is the guy, and I'm going to remind you, that is a bundle of nerves when he gets up in front of people. Couldn't tell it though, right? And that's when there's 50 or 60 people sitting in these pews. When yesterday we had a solid, what Kathy say, 800? Yeah. It, was, it was about four, three or four, between here and back there, and who knows how many left in between. And as I, we come to the table this morning, I think about how Paul says, your heart has to be in the right place when you come to the Lord's table. Your heart better be in the right place anytime you come before the Lord. And I know where Rob's heart is all the time, all the time. He has a heart for the youth of this church like nobody I've ever seen. And I believe when Mike was talking yesterday, he was saying that, you know, when, when we started talking, Rob started talking about asking for prayers for Dave and nobody, well, very few people knew him at the time. And then he finally comes and it was, it was very easy to see what, what all the fuss was about. So as, as we come to this table this morning, I want you to... Take a, take a moment to examine your heart to make sure that it's in the right place as we come to the Lord's table. And also as we go to prayer. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance for me. And in the same manner, he poured the wine. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we, we come to your table this morning, we're reminded of that tremendous sacrifice of the body crucified and the blood shed to remove the sins of mankind. Only you could have come to this earth and paid that price, Father. We're so thankful to have you in our lives, to have you as our Lord and Savior, that we can come before you, that we can stand before you in prayer. We thank you, Father. We thank you for the hope of eternal life, that we can live with you in heaven, in your glory. We thank you that we know that you have intervened. We ask so many times, why doesn't, why doesn't God do this? Why doesn't God do that? You did 2,000 years ago. Your son died on that cross for us. We will live an eternal life with perfect bodies, no sadness, no despair, only your love. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. And in 
Laurie and I have been camping this weekend, I, I guess more appropriately be called glamping. We don't do the camping thing much. Ground's too hard, too far away. <laughs> uh, but when we got there Friday night, we got ready to fix dinner, and we had everything to fix any meal that we wanted except one thing. Everything we went to fix, we had everything but one thing. So finally we just said, forget it. We'll go to Southern Kitchen, let's go get something to eat. We pull in and the place is absolutely packed. Can't hardly find a parking place. So we're walking in and another couple gets out about the same time we do. Never met them before. So we're walking up to the restaurant. Laurie and the lady, other lady go in to put her names in for a table. Come back out in 25, 30 minute wait. So we're talking and get joking about eating together and things like that. And they're on their way from Gatlinburg, Tennessee to the eastern shore of Maryland. So we talk for 25, 30 minutes. They get called to their table. He said, we have a real tiny booth for you if you want to sit there. And they're like, sure. So we, you know, exchanged goodbyes and they went on and sat down. Well, just less than a minute later, here comes the guy back up to the front. He said, they moved us from this booth to this other booth that seat four people. Why don't you all join us? So we sat there for an hour, talking, telling stories, sharing with each other. And I, and I tell you this story because it really relates to our message today and our, and our sermon topic for today that you really don't have to make a big effort to share your faith with people. Just be who you are, be aware of what God wants you to do, where God's leading you, and just let, let the Holy Spirit lead you where you're going. Uh, I had a great conversation with them. They're both believers. When we left, we went out in the parking lot. We prayed with them before they left, exchanged contact information. Uh, David and Susan, if you're watching, give us a call. We'll meet you at Southern Kitchen anytime. <laughs> uh, with that, we'll have the benediction because I've shared about everything that we're going to cover today in, in the sermon. Uh, so we're going to be in Acts chapter 8 this morning, beginning with um, verse 26, and we'll go through the end of the chapter. Luke writes, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting on it in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him, and this is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. 
as they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you again, humbly looking at your word and seeing what it might do in our lives to change our lives and to bring us closer to you. Give us attentive ears and listening hearts to hear what your spirit is telling us today. In Jesus' name, amen. What gets you excited? Someone once said you cannot kindle a fire in any other heart until it is burning in your own. Another word for excitement is enthusiasm. It's been said that enthusiasm is unmistakable evidence that you are in love with your work. Charles Schwab is credited with saying, a man can succeed at almost anything for which he has unlimited enthusiasm. So if we're excited about our relationship with Jesus, it shouldn't be hard to tell others about that relationship. We can talk to people about all kinds of things, the weather, our favorite sports team, our favorite television show, a hobby that we enjoy, or any other topic of interest because it excites us and we want to share the excitement with other people. So why not our faith? In his book, Strengthening Your Grip, Charles Swindoll lists four basic hindrances to sharing our faith. The first is a bad experience. Maybe as a non-Christian you met someone who seemed to be a wild-eyed fanatic who pushed you maybe even embarrassed you trying to force a decision for Jesus. The second would be indifference. As hard as it is to admit, there are some folks who claim to be believers that just do not care that people are lost and will spend this life without Christ and will spend eternity in hell. They think, hey, that's the way that person wants to believe. That's fine with me. To each his own. The third reason would be fear. We're just plain scared. We're afraid that we'll be asked a question that we can't answer. Or or we're afraid that someone will get mad at us and tell us off. And the fourth would be ignorance. We don't know how to go about sharing our faith. And this passage from Acts 8 describes someone sharing their faith. It's a fairly well-known story about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And most of the time that I've heard this preached in a sermon or taught in a lesson... The emphasis is on the doctrine of baptism for salvation. But for those who are hesitant about sharing their faith, this passage demonstrates a simple and effective plan to overcome that hesitation. And as we look at this passage this morning, we'll see six steps to help us in sharing our faith with others. First, you need to make yourself available. Make yourself available. Acts 8, 26 and 27 says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. Availability is anything that makes itself accessible for use in a situation. Availability is what we see in Isaiah 6, verse 8, when the prophet said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. One of the favorite sayings of a preacher friend of mine is, God doesn't want your capability. He only wants your availability. If you will give him your availability, he will provide the capability. The biggest hindrance to our, to our availability is our calendars. Our calendars are so full that we use the excuse, I don't have time, when the opportunity to share our faith comes along. If I take the time to share my faith, I'll be late for my next appointment. If I share my faith now at the gas station, I won't have time to stop at Starbucks on my way to work. If I share my faith in Starbucks this morning, I'm going to be late for church. And let me just clarify, if that's the case, if you're going to be late, if if you stop at Starbucks, you're going to be late for church. If you share your faith, share your faith at Starbucks. Be late for church. Don't come to church. Share your faith. 
That's a whole lot more important. Most of us need to lighten our calendars so that we can be more available for God's greater purpose. Marriage and family therapist Philip Clark Brewer says it this way, God uses what you have to fill a need which you never could have filled. God uses where you are to take you where you never could have gone. God uses what you can do to accomplish what you never could have done. And God uses who you are to let you become who you never could have been. So the first step in sharing your faith is to make yourself available. Second, we need to know that God prepares hearts. God prepares hearts. And on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. How did God prepare the heart of this Ethiopian official? He was returning from worship in Jerusalem. He was reading the scripture. But God doesn't prepare every heart the same way every time. The essential thing is that this preparation is a process. It develops in the person the knowledge that there's a need for God in their lives, and there's a need to know God on a personal level. Sometimes God prepares the hearts of people that will take us out of our comfort zone. For the past year, I've been studying and researching what are called disciple-making movements. And through these movements, literally hundreds of thousands of people are coming to faith in Christ in places like India, Africa, China, Korea, and other places that are hostile to the gospel. And the first step in this process is praying for what's called a person of peace. Now, a person of peace is someone who's not a believer, but the Holy Spirit is softening their heart to be receptive to the gospel. In one particular incident, the person of peace was the father of a city's most notorious drug dealer. The dad was on the balcony of his apartment when a group of Christians came through the neighborhood praying for this person of peace. The dad was receptive to the gospel, accepted Christ, and began leading a Bible study in the apartment that he shared with his son. His son would hear the gospel each time they would meet, but he hadn't accepted Christ. But when others in the apartment complex became suspicious and thought the Christians were working with the police to snitch on them, the son used his reputation in the community to make sure that the Christians were kept safe. He wasn't a Christian, but God was using him in that area to make sure that others heard the gospel. He wasn't restricting the gospel, even though he hadn't accepted it yet. Preparation is the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 16, But very truly I tell you, it is good for you that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the Prince of this world now stands condemned. Know that God prepares hearts of those we share our faith with through the Holy Spirit. And we also need to listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is preparing hearts ahead of time, you can be sure that God knows when they're ready to hear the gospel. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. I wonder if you can relate to a situation that was shared in a magazine I read some years ago. The writer of the article says, I was working a week of junior camp in southwestern Kentucky. One of the faculty members brought their 17-year-old daughter with them to help out at camp. The faculty member and I had worked several weeks of camp together and were friends. She told me that her daughter had never committed her life to Christ. She had brought her along not just to help out that week of camp, but also to be helped along in making a decision to follow Christ. She then asked if I could maybe talk to her daughter, who was named Peggy, about that decision, which I did every day, to no avail. Also during that week, there was a death in the family of one of my church members. I left camp on Wednesday to comfort the family and tie down arrangements for the funeral, which would be on Saturday morning. 
Although camp wasn't finished until Saturday morning, I had to leave late Friday night to return home and be ready for the funeral the next day. I went around the camp saying goodbyes and then got in my car to head home. I put the keys in the ignition but could not turn the key. There was a very clear voice ringing in my head saying, you can't leave until you talk to Peggy one more time about her decision. Like anyone else, I argued why I couldn't accomplish that task. Obviously, I had to leave to be able to do the funeral. I sat in the car about 20 minutes, jockeying back and forth with the Holy Spirit about talking to Peggy one more time. I got out of the car, walked to the girls' dormitory, and knocked. One of the female faculty answered the door, and I asked if I could speak to Peggy. She said okay and went to retrieve the young lady. Peggy and I walked next door to the chapel, and I told her that I wasn't going to leave until I spoke to her one more time about her decision. She broke out into tears and said, I want to give my life to Christ. I went back to the girl's dormitory and this time asked for her mom. When I told her mom what had happened, she broke down into tears. I also informed her mom that Peggy wanted to be baptized by me that night before I left. She hardly gave her consent and I went to wake up the camp manager so he could unlock the gate to the pool. He was sound asleep and no one from his family quarters answered my knocks. We had to break into one of the storage sheds, get a ladder, climb the fence, and with all the campers and most of the faculty around the fence to the pool, I baptized Peggy into her relationship with Jesus Christ. It was because of my listening to and obedience to the voice of the Holy Spirit that Peggy finally made her decision. Now, would Peggy have made her decision to follow Jesus Christ and be baptized without the help of that minister and his going back to talk to her? Probably, because the Holy Spirit was working in her life. But that minister would have missed a fantastic blessing if he had failed to finally heed the instruction of the Holy Spirit and an eternal life or death matter. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. So we need to be available. We need to know that God prepares hearts. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit's prompting. And we need to start where people are and guide them to where they need to be. Start where people are and guide them to where they need to be. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as the lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Notice how Philip handles this situation. He paid attention to what was happening in the Ethiopian official's life at that very moment. He listened very carefully to the man's request. He responded directly to the man's request. He was ready to answer the man's questions. The most important thing that we can do when sharing your faith is to put yourself in the other person's place. Sharing your faith is important, but it's essential to be a good listener. The other person is thinking, don't just expect me to listen to you. I want you to listen to me. Frank Delano Roosevelt decided one time to find out if anybody was paying attention to what he was saying. So at a diplomatic dinner, Roosevelt stood in the receiving line. And as each person came up to him to shake hands, he would heartily shake their hand, flash his big smile and say, I murdered my grandmother this morning. People would automatically respond with comments such as, how lovely, or just continue with your great work. No one was actually listening to what he had to say, except for one foreign diplomat. When FDR said, I murdered my grandmother this morning, the diplomat leaned in and responded softly, I'm sure she had it coming. <laughs> People are also saying to us, talk with me, don't talk down to me. 
The old maxim is true. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Jesus cared about individuals. He not only died for the whole world, but also for each person individually. Jesus stopped his busy agenda to meet and minister to individuals. Zacchaeus in a tree. A bleeding Syrophoenician woman who reached out from a crowd. Blind Bartimaeus on the side of the road. A Samaritan woman at the well. In each situation, Jesus showed how much he cared about the individual. They're also saying, please use words that I understand. We need to stop using secret religious code words that non-Christians don't understand. We face an increasingly secular society. More and more people around us have never stepped into a church building. You can't talk graduate school theology to someone who's never even been to Sunday school. We cannot assume that people will understand words like justification, sanctification, and propitiation. And I just talk over most of his heads. Many people in the church don't even know what these words mean. They might be words that we're used to, but they're a foreign language to the unchurched. They don't even know what the term born again means. We have to break it down into terms that they will understand. Jesus accomplished this task by using concepts that the people he was speaking to at that time could understand. When he talked to farmers, Jesus spoke about sowing seeds. When talking to businessmen, he talked about profit and loss. When talking to fishermen, he spoke about fishing for people. Start where people are, guide them to where they need to be. And once they understand what we're saying, be sure to declare the gospel. Now, our word gospel comes from an old English word that means good news. In the New Testament, it was a term that literally meant good news about a victory. It's the same word the angel used when he announced the birth of Jesus. I bring good tidings of great joy. This is not a time for us to give the person a guilt complex. It's not a time to point out all their sinful behavior. Declare the love of Jesus, not the punishment of sin. If the other steps have been effective, the Holy Spirit has already started this process in their life. It's also not a time for scare tactics. Threatening people with the thought of living in hell for eternity may be effective on the surface, but it's a poor way to make disciples. The disciple-making movement uses a three-circle approach in sharing the gospel. Anyone showed you the three circles before? Have you heard of the three? three circles before? Has anyone ever shared the three circles with you before? No. Mm-hmm. So this is the first circle. So this represents the world that's broken. All of us live in a broken world. You only have to turn on the news and see suffering, death, war, sickness, rape, disease. It's everywhere, right? But you know, God didn't actually create the world to be like this for a broken society. Here's the second circle. This circle represents God's perfect design. God's perfect design was a world without brokenness. A world full of love. Full of joy and peace and unity. But what we did was we sinned. Sin could be anything from lying to murder. murder. It's like just like normal lying or like hard lying. And what sin did, it separated us from God's perfect design and threw us into brokenness. And so people try all kinds of different things to get out of brokenness. You might try drugs or alcohol. Or maybe chasing a career or money. Smoking. Even bullying other people at school. Oh, sleeping around. Suicide, exactly, good example. But it doesn't actually fix the problem of brokenness. It's like a bungee cord. We just get snapped straight back into brokenness. And ultimately, if people die in that state of brokenness and separate from God, and that means that that's eternal separation from God. Do you know what this place is often called? Yes. So what God did was, he didn't want to leave us in that place. God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. Jesus was God, so he had no sin. And when he died and rose again, he actually took on all of our sin and cancelled it, like he crushed it. He said if we would turn away from our sin and believe in Jesus and make Jesus the Lord of our life, we become restored. restored back into God's original design. And you become a new creation, a new person in Christ. And will restore us back into relationship with Him. So there's only 
two kinds of people in this world, people that are in brokenness or God's perfect design. Where would you see yourself? Probably right there, to be honest. Yeah, this is so cool. I'm not sure. Love? Love. The boundary stage. <laughs> yeah, the same. And where would, would you like, you like to So where be? would you like to be? Like, You'd like to be here? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Can you look at this? That's so cool. One of God? So here? So is there anything that's stopping you? From turning and, and believing in Jesus? And allow him to be Lord and King of your life? Stubbornness? Probably not. Probably we, to be honest. Nothing's stopping you. You know the awesome news about Jesus? He is the only way out. If you try to clean yourself up before coming to Jesus, it's like trying to get clean before you take a shower. Oh, I see, yeah. Is there anything stopping you? We shared the three circles with 34 people. Four were already believers. 13 chose to remain in brokenness, but some were deeply impacted. And 17 wanted to leave brokenness and receive Christ. That was a little bit hard to hear, I know, but if you if you do a YouTube search or a Google search, just put in three circles, it, it'll it'll come up and you can watch again. It, it's really an effective and simple and non-threatening way to witness to people about Jesus. As you can see, they had 34 people, I think it said, 17, you know, made a commitment of faith. 13 didn't, 4 were kind of on the fence. So it's not a guarantee, but it's a very effective way to share the gospel. And the message of good news or the gospel as presented in the New Testament follows a basic pattern, which this three circles shows very well. As people, we're all separated from God through sin, and we look for things to fill that empty relationship. God sent the answer for this empty relationship in His Son, Jesus. The same Jesus lived a sinless life, was executed for sins he did not commit, died in our place, was buried but rose from the grave three days later to give us victory in this life, victory over death, and an eternal home with Jesus. Jesus now calls everyone to acknowledge him as Savior and Lord and also to come to relationship with him through trusting in him by faith and confession, turning away from the life that we've been leading and live a life under his lordship. This is repentance. Experience death to that old life and resurrection, to the new life he offers us through baptism, and receive the power he offers to us through his Holy Spirit. And as we explain and declare the gospel, we need to be prepared for a decision. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. How many times have we assumed that the person that needs Jesus knows what they need to do next. A sales manager was trying to determine why his salespeople were not producing orders from customers like they should. They were selling needed products made with quality materials, and they were asking an affordable price. Each of his salespeople were thoroughly supplied with all the information concerning their products, and they were all hardworking and likable. The sales manager decided he would travel with his salespeople to see where the problem was. And when he finished the task of sitting through the sales presentation of all his people, he called all of them together for a meeting. At this meeting, he announced that he had discovered the reason why the sales force was not producing orders like they should. He said, ladies and gentlemen, the reason we do not get orders is that we don't ask for them. What the sales manager had discovered is that each of his salespeople would conclude their sales presentation without asking for an order. They would simply wait around for a few minutes, talk some small talk, shake hands, and then leave. They failed to ask their customers if they wanted to buy what they were selling. At the end of almost every worship service, as a wrap-up to the sermon, I offer an invitation for people to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That invitation usually includes an invitation to recommit one's life to Christ 
or to join the fellowship of believers at First Christian Church. When we share the gospel with someone and the time comes, there are two decisions for that person to make. The person can say no to Jesus. They can say no to that relationship and that invitation and eternal life. But it's important that we remember it's not our invitation. It's Jesus' invitation. It's not us that they're rejecting. It's Christ that they're rejecting. And even though it's Christ that they're rejecting, we still need to follow up on those no decisions. Although prayer should have saturated our effort from the start, it's doubly important to pray for that person after a negative response. It's also important to keep reaffirming that we still care about that person. We need to let them know that they're not just religious brownie points on a heavenly scoreboard, but that we truly care for them as an individual. And they could also say yes to Jesus' invitation to relationship and eternal life. Even when a person says yes, we need to be prepared to follow up on that decision. We can't just dunk them and drop them. Notice that this Ethiopian official went on his way, and as far as we know, he never saw Philip again. At least it's never mentioned in Scripture. How many times have we done this to new converts? We have to teach them the things of Christ more fully, or as Christ said, teach them all things which I have commanded. Sharing our faith is different than sharing our ideas and feelings. People don't need our ideas and our feelings. What people need is Jesus Christ. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a colt before his last Passover festival, the Apostle John wrote, Now there were some Greeks among them, among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. People have very real questions and very real hurts in their lives. They don't need political answers. They don't need philosophical answers. They don't need psychological answers. They need the answer. They need Jesus Christ. If this portion of scripture we're looking at this morning tells us anything, it tells us that God loves us and that he wants to make a difference in our lives. It tells us that he's provided what's needed for us to receive his help in our lives. For almost 2,000 years, faithful Christian people have been active in telling others about the good news in Jesus Christ. Notice that when this Ethiopian official accepted this good news and was obedient to its demands, Luke tells us that he went on his way rejoicing. No longer was there an empty space in his life. No longer was there a nagging feeling that something was missing. He had found what was missing, and now that emptiness was filled with joy. God has done everything possible for you and I to have that kind of joy in our lives. The only thing still missing is a decision to follow him. Max Licato sums it up well when he says, If there are a thousand steps between us and God, he will take all but one. He will leave the final one for us. Take that final step this morning out of the darkness without Jesus and then take that first step and do a new life walking into the light and forgiveness of his love. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know that there are difficult times in our lives, especially in our current culture when everything that people seem to not like or to be against, they just want to cancel it. They just want to get rid of it. But Lord, you've still given us the great commission to make disciples of all nations. Lord, you've given us testament in your word of how to go about doing that. We've just seen that today in the case of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And Lord, those words are good, they're true, and they're right. But if all we do is hear them and we don't apply them into our lives, it's not going to make much difference in the kingdom. So, Lord, our challenge this morning is to take what we've learned today, apply that into our lives, and 
today and tomorrow and the coming weeks and months ahead. Let us be bold in sharing the gospel, but also let us do it with compassion and love, knowing that you were compassionate and loving with, and forgiving with us, and you're still patient with us as we continue to grow. Lord, let us have that same desire for others and that same compassion for others as well. Lord, if there's one here this morning who has not made that commitment to make you Lord and Savior of their life, today would be a great day to do that. They've heard the gospel. They know what needs to be done. Lord, let that day of salvation be to someone today. In Jesus' name, amen. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and His glory, of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies. I know Linda's going to need this, so I'll go ahead and be ready. <laughs> uh, just as a, an aside from yesterday's service with David, uh, a lot of us had specific things that we were asked to do. Uh, Linda with her kitchen staff did an excellent job with the meal, all different things. But I want to thank those, and I won't mention any names because I'll forget somebody, of those who stepped in 
with a need that wasn't expected. They just saw something need to be done. They stepped in, they took care of it, and made everything go much, much better. Uh, there were some issues with parking. I understand they were parked up and down Merriman's Lane, traffic getting out of the parking lot. Uh, people just stepped in and took care of those things without asking. They knew it needed to be done, and they took care of it. Thank you all for that very, very much. <laughs> oh, you could beat Andrew? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, next Saturday is our bazaar. Um, we still have some things that need to be, um, they need in the kitchen for the bazaar. I also need recipes for the tasting room. You have to, Melissa goes home on Tuesday, which is at 2 o'clock? Yes. At 2 o'clock to get the recipes in. I also have my email address out there on a piece of paper that you can send me your um, recipe. Um, I would need it prepared and ready to go on Saturday morning, and I need it here at 8.45 because we open up at 9. Also, two weeks from today is our Thanksgiving dinner. I have some recipes out there that we need of the sweet potato casserole and the um, cranberry salad. The recipe is out there that we need. It needs to be prepared and either be cold or hot when it comes in. Make sure you sign up as to whether you're going to stay for lunch or for take it home. And for those of you at home, um, if you would like a Thanksgiving meal, you need to call the office so that Melissa can put it on the list, and you can just drive up and pick it up. We'll have people that will deliver it out there to you. But we need to know exactly how many people, and we need to know it by that Wednesday of the week before. So that's the what, the 7, 18th? 13, 14, 15, 16, that's 17th. 17th. 17th, and we'll need to have that number so that we can have enough food to prepare. If you, wanted to, if you desire to stay here and eat, that's fine. We will have tables set up for you to, to eat. So um, it's a busy month, Thanksgiving is. and th I, mean, I should say November is with Thanksgiving, and I know Lauren needs stuff for the third week when we do the um, food, do the food baskets. And there's a list outside, out there on the narthex on a table of things that they need for in the pantry. So check it out. I know it's a busy time, and we have lots of things that we need. It seems like we're asking for things all the time, but this is our busiest month is November. So we need your help because we reach out to everybody in the, in the um, community for all yeah. this stuff. So. Thank you, Linda. Um, and to piggyback off of Linda real quick too, we serve almost 30 families every month um, that don't have food with our food pantry. So it definitely is one of our um, fastest growing ministries. Um, so it needs a lot of support. So the other side of that is um, we have a youth event. It's not on here because we had a slight um, schedule change with it. Um, but next Sunday, the 14th from 5 to 7, we'll be doing a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving with all of our um, kids. And that is for families to come and also um, older kids. And I know some older kids probably don't want their mom and dads there, but your mom and dads are more than welcome to stay and hang out and have their own little section if they want. Um, and we'll, we'll have all the fixings and um, have a couple of activities and different things to do. So y'all are more than welcome to come out from 5 to 7 next um, Sunday, and it'll be here in the fellowship hall. So that is my only okay. promise I won't steal the spotlight no more. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy. Poinsettia orders due December 7th. I'll, I'll sum it up real quick for those on Facebook. Uh, also, one, one more thing, then, then we'll go. Next Sunday, two more things. I, f I must have forgot one. Yes, Life Meal is this coming Wednesday. Sign-up sheet is in the foyer. Uh, the other is the congregational meeting will be next Sunday, following worship service, immediately following worship service. Uh, if you've been a member of First Christian Church for six months, I believe our bylaws say... You can vote in the meeting. Uh, anyone can attend the meeting, but you have to be a member for six months for, for voting. I will be voting on budget, elders, and deacons. And as far as I know, that's all we'll have. So with that, let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the day you've given to us. Thankful for the beauty of this time of year as we can see your, the beauty of your creation as the leaves change from fall and we prepare for winter. 
Lord, just let us, let us go out this week with your spirit in us and your spirit in front of us as you lead those who don't know you into our path that we can share the good news of salvation with them this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, girl. How are you? Good. Good.